Now that we know that some Muslims in a cave in Afghanistan somewhere were certainly not capable of such a sophisticated uh, explosion and plan, then we have to ask ourselves, then who? Since we know it was not the Muslims, who's responsible for this heavily sophisticated plan, which is the mother of all false flag events? Well, as we said in the offset of this program, we not only want to uncover the lies, but we also want to uncover and pinpoint the liars. So to take us further, our last presenter is a, one of those allies that we have who will help us pinpoint who is behind and who is most responsible, who are the culprits behind these activities. We have as our final presenter, Mr. Christopher Bolin. Bolin is a well-traveled writer and an investigative journalist who has done extensive research into the events of 9-11. As a thinker, he has been highly, highly critical of Israel. And he was also part of the, um, uh, with Mr. Stephen Jones, who was one of those that found the thermite in um, the debris of 9-11. Now, consequently, that same year, for him being critical of being critical of Israel and the war on terror, he was attacked by a heavily armed group of police. Well, he's with us today. And to take us further to expose the culprits behind this wicked atrocity, help me to receive to the stage Mr. Christopher Bolin. Let's welcome him, family. Hello, can you hear me all right? It's great to be here. Salam Alaikum. I want to uh, recognize the great efforts of Minister Louis Farrakhan in being the only religious leader in our nation who has addressed the, the gigantic, horrendous fraud of 9-11. You see, 9-11, 9-11 was used to take us into an open-ended war against Islamic nations. And that's where this nation has been for the past 15 years. And not a, not a single religious leader, other than Minister Farrakhan, has had the moral compass to stand up and tell the faithful that we've been lied to. So, I've written this book, Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World. It's changed our world. 9-11 was carried out to kickstart the war on terror, a Zionist war agenda of aggression, terrorism, and conquest, which continues to this day. 9-11 was wrongly blamed on Muslims to trick us as a nation, as a world, into supporting an open-ended and criminal war agenda across the Islamic world. It's cost us more than two and a half trillion dollars, and we as people of conscience are obliged to resist the deception, as our religious leaders all should do. I was an investigative journalist in Washington, D.C. when it happened, so it fell right into my lap. I was passing through New York City with my family when 9-11 happened. I grew up in Chicago, outside in a place called Schaumburg, Illinois. Here's my book, The Deception That Changed the World. 9-11 was a highly sophisticated false flag terror atrocity designed to create fear and rage in the people's hearts to compel U.S. public opinion to support the war on terror which is an Israeli Zionist war agenda in disguise that we are supposed to fight. Starting the war on terror was the real reason for 9-11. 9-11 was, of course, a policy coup that brought us the war on terror and a series of wars like this one in Iraq. We've been deceived. We've been lied to. 9-11 was just the beginning. 
Starting the war of, of aggression was the real reason for the terrorism. We will not have peace as a nation or a world if we continue to accept the deception of 9-11. The media has been the key player in the deception. We've been lied to by the media. The media is complicit in the cover-up. They have imposed on the American public the false story that radical Islamic terrorists are to blame for 9-11. And the only way to liberate ourselves and our nations from this madness is to expose the true source of terrorism. The U.S. government on 9-11 called the, the war, the, the attacks, an act of war, which basically made it the military's business to seek justice for. So there was no actual criminal investigation. Larry Johnson from the State Department, Secretary, uh, D D Director of Counterterrorism, said these guys were extremely well organized, talking about the hijackers, the alleged hijackers. He said these guys were just committed zealots and willing to give it up without being key members of the network. They were told what to do, what to prepare for, what to train for. They were not the ones calling the shots. He said, we don't have anything in history to compare with this. The only thing that comes close to it is a former Soviet intelligence operation. So who pulled this off? Now, if the government and media are lying to us about 9-11, it means that they are controlled by the very same people who carried out 9-11. Now that's a very serious predicament. And Minister Farrakhan's the only person who's addressing it. Now, 9-11 and the War on Terror have a common source. Both 9-11 and the War on Terror were conceived and planned in Israel in the 1970s by Israeli military intelligence. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the War on Terror. Nine days after 9-11, George Bush declared a War on Terror basically telling the world, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. The war on terror has cost this nation over two and a half trillion dollars. Now you can imagine how far that would go to supporting and helping the American people rebuild our infrastructure, support our communities. The war on terror is a fraud you have as much likelihood in this nation of being a victim of terrorism as you do of being struck by lightning. But we're spending $400 million per year per victim of terrorism in this nation. Compared to cancer and, and influenza and heart disease, you would have to stack that bill, those bills up a thousand times higher to understand how much money. This is a fraud. So the fraudulent war on terror is all based on the 9-11 lies. Where did the war on terror come from? Where did Americans start to learn to treat people like this? Well, the war on terror. I'm going to talk about the evolution of an Israeli stratagem. Now, a stratagem is a, is a clever device to trick people into serving them. The war on terror is an Israeli stratagem, a ploy pushed by Benjamin Netanyahu since 1979 to trick the United States into waging war against Israel's enemies. Here he was in 1979, he came, he worked for a Rothschild company called Boston Consulting. He went back to Israel and he started a Netanyahu Institute. The very first thing they did in 1979, they had a conference in Jerusalem called the Jerusalem Conference on International Terrorism. They tried to say that all international terrorism is a propaganda offensive. They said that all international terrorism was coming from the Soviet Union. And George Bush spoke at the final, Mr. Bush Sr. spoke at the final session and said that basically the idea of fighting terrorism was a great thing to do as a war. Now, Mr. Netanyahu is currently the Prime Minister of Israel. He has made a career out of promoting the war on terror, writing books like this. Now, he, Mr. Netanyahu, is from the Likud coalition, Likud. The Likud was created by the father of terrorism, a man named Menachem Begin. 
Menachem Begin in 1977 became Prime Minister of Israel and he was asked by a British journalist in 1974, Mr. Begin, how does it feel in the light of all that's going on to be the father of terrorism in the Middle East? And Mr. Begin said, in the Middle East? He said, in all the world. So he put on himself the mantle of being the father of terrorism. You see, you have to understand that the state of Israel was born and created through terrorism. This is 1946. This is one of the first things he did as head of the Irgun. The Irgun is the mother party of the, of the Likud. He blew up the King David Hotel, killing 93 people. British, it was British headquarters during the British Mandate period in Palestine. It's very, very similar to 9-11. Here he is, he came from Russia, came to Palestine, became the leader of the Irgun, bombed the King David Hotel, created the Deir Yassin massacre where they blew up buildings in a Palestinian village called Deir Yassin in order to scare the Palestinians that they would run away. And then he created the Likud party in 73, became prime minister in 77. That's when Israel changed from being a relatively uh, peaceful country to becoming a vicious terrorist state, 1977. The ideology of the Likud is based on this idea called Eretz Israel, Greater Israel. This idea that Israel should, should fill its, its biblical boundaries as they say God gave to the state of Israel. And so they have a, a much bigger idea of what Israel should be. And they are dedicated to reaching that state. That's very important to understand. This is, the, this is what they call what Israel's future borders should look like. And as Mr. Begin said, Jerusalem was and forever will be our capital and Eretz Israel will be restored to the people of Israel. Now this is what Begin said in 1947 and this is exactly what the Likud still continues to, to say to this day. So here he became the president of the country, the prime minister of the country in 1977. This happened to be a time when I was living in Israel. They came to power, 77, now, one of his partners was this man, Yitzhak Shamir. And I, I want to point out that this is a, this is a member, this was the, the head of the Lehi, or the Stern Gang. This was a gang of murderers. They killed the UN envoy, Volker Bernadotte. They killed rocket scientists. And his little gang called the Stern Gang had a, a very interesting member who was this man's father. This is Ram Emanuel. He's the mayor of my hometown, Chicago. And his father was a member of the Stern Gang when they killed that UN ambassador. Now here are some of the fathers of terrorism. This is a photograph from the Lavon Affair. The Israelis did a, a false flag terror attacks in Egypt back in 1954, in July. And it was run by these men here. On the, on the left is Shimon Perez, then Mr. Lavon, then Moshe Dayan and his assistant. And they blew up, they put bombs in American and British libraries in Egypt with the intention of the, the blame being put on the Muslim Brotherhood. Because Mr. the Prime Minister of, of Israel said after this event, he didn't know about it, but Shimon Peres had been running it. And he said, Shimon Peres shares the same ideology. He wants to frighten the West into supporting Israel's aims. And that is exactly where we are here today with terrorism. They're trying to frighten us all the time into supporting their war agenda. But it's not our agenda, and it's not an American agenda. In 1948, before Israel became a state, the Joint Chiefs of Staff analyzed what this, this Israeli Zionist state, Zionism means Israeli nationalism, Jewish nationalism. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff said this, they wrote this in their 13th paper, they said, Zionist strategy will seek to involve the United States in a continuously widening and deepening series of operations intended to secure maximum Jewish objectives. And what were those maximum Jewish objectives? The expansion of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, into Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, and the establishment of Jewish military and economic hegemony over the entire Middle East. As you can see, that's what the United States has been doing for the past 15 years. 
Now, this is a, these were the strategic goals of the father of Israel, Ben Gurion, who was another Rothschild employee. He said in 1948, after Israel became a state, he said we should go on the offensive and smash Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and then and then take out Jordan, Syria will fall, and if Egypt dares to resist, we'll bomb Cairo. This is the pre Prime Minister of Israel, one week after the nation became a state. This is, of course, what Israel did to the United States. Many people will say, oh, Israel wouldn't do that. They wouldn't attack us. Well, read your history, 1967. They attacked this ship, and they told, the Tel Aviv said, from the radio control, said, identify the ship. The pilot said, it's American, American. Tel Aviv control said, sink the ship, no survivors. Now, a week after 9-11, this General Wesley Clark walked through the Pentagon, and he said, about 10 days after 9-11, I went to the Pentagon, I saw Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz, and one of the generals called me in and he said, we've made the decision, we're going to war with Iraq. We're going to war with Iraq, I, he said, why? I don't know, he said. I came back a few weeks later, he said, and by that time we were bombing Afghanistan. And he said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And the general said, oh sir, it's much worse than that. We're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. And as you can see, that shopping list is exactly what we've been doing for the past 15 years. Now, what's the master plan? It's a Zionist master plan to dominate the entire region by breaking up the large Arab countries into ethnic statelets. It's called balkanization. It's exactly what we did in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. We took a big country and broke it into little pieces, fracturing it along religious lines or ethnic lines. This is the, this is the plan that the Israeli Likud came out with a man named Oded Yinon in 1982. And thanks to Israel Shahak, it was a professor of chemistry, he translated it into English, and we now understand what the Israeli plan is for the Middle East. It's exactly what's happened to Iraq, to Syria, to Libya, to Sudan, to Somalia, to Yemen. All have been victimized by this plan, breaking them up. Who's behind it? Well, here we have a picture from the Pentagon. We have something called the Defense Policy Board. These are mostly Zionist men. Here we have Wolfowitz and Rabbi, Rabbi Dov Zakheim across the table, and the Israeli boy uh, Douglas Fife, and they're sitting right next to the Israeli Chief of Staff in the Pentagon. And he's telling them, well, this is what you should do, and that's what we've done. They advise us, the Israelis tell our Pentagon what we should be doing. Here's Hillary Clinton, and this is 2012 when she was Secretary of State, and she wrote in that email, the best way to help Israel is to use force to overthrow the government in Syria. Where is there American interest in overthrowing the government? None. But this proves that, that Obama and, and Hillary Clinton we're serving Israeli ends, not American. So 22 years after it was first promoted, this idea of a war on terror in Jerusalem, it became reality with 9-11. It was born. Now I'm going to talk about the Israeli connections to 9-11. Number one, ideation. The Israelis put out the idea that planes might be flying into big buildings one day. This is a film by a senior Israeli agent named Arnon Milchan, a Hollywood producer, a very high-level Israeli agent. He made this film in 1978 called The Medusa Touch, in which a large Boeing plane flies into the Pan Am building in New York City. This is from the movie. Now, is this coincidence or is this prescience? Now, the thing is that he's very close, and the, the picture shows him with with the Defense Minister of Israel, Ezra Weizmann. This is at the very highest level of Israeli military intelligence. And here he's making the movie. Here he is, he's worth $5.2 billion, and you can see he's very close to the very highest level establishment in Israel, Shimon Peres and Bibi Netanyahu, two of the most notorious Israeli terrorists in history. 
Then, in the year 2000, with his business partner, Rupert Murdoch of Fox News, they made a program, a TV program called The Lone Gunman, in which a Boeing 740, a 757 is flown into the World Trade Center. And this was on TV in March 2001 on Fox News. 13 million people watched it. This is putting the idea out there into your mind that planes might be striking big buildings one day. Now, the next thing is the father of Israeli intelligence, this man Isra Harel, he predicted in 1979 that Islamic or Arabs would attack the tallest buildings in New York City. He predicted to this man, this uh, Jewish man here with Menachem Begin, and he said, he, Mr. Mr. Evans asked Harel, he said, Harel, do you think terrorism will come to America? And if so, where and why? Issa Harel said, yes, I fear it will come to you in America. America has the power but not the will to fight terrorism. As to where, Harel continued, New York City is the symbol of freedom and capitalism. It's likely they will strike your tallest building and a symbol of your power. 1979, 22 years before 9-11. Then number three, the Israeli Mossad got the security contract for the World Trade Center in 1987 because they actually intended that 9-11 would happen in the 1980s, but they were delayed. Because the Port Authority discovered that the man involved was not only an Israeli intelligence agent, but he was using a fake name. He was using a false name, they often do. So they tore up the contract, the Port Authority, the owners of the World Trade Center, they tore up the contract. Had they not done that, 9-11 would have happened, as I say, in the late 80s. But when those Israelis were, were thwarted, they didn't go back to Israel. They went to work with American Jews who, who were working in the World Trade Center, namely Jules Kroll and Maurice Greenberg. And in 1993, when the building was bombed the first time, Jules Kroll, the man at the top here, got the security contract for the World Trade Center. And at that time, that Israeli man that was the head of the Shin Bet was now working for him. So they used a Trojan horse to get into the, into the World Trade Center. Number four, Israel, Israeli military intelligence, created Al-Qaeda. They created the Islamic foe for the war on terror. Because if you're, if you're going to have a big war on terror, you have to have an enemy. So they have to create the enemy. So under Ehud Barak, in the 19, early 1980s, Israeli military intelligence trained a group in Pakistan of Afghan fighters and Arabs called Gulbadin Hekmatyar, faction Hizb Islami. At this time, this is when the Afghan, what they call the Afghan Arabs, the Arabs came to Afghanistan to help the Afghans fighters against the Russian army, the Soviet army. And at, this is the time when Israeli military intelligence under Ehud Barak, this man on the left, was running the operation. The CIA was paying for it, and Saudi Arabia were paying for it. Pakistan was the host country, and Israel military intelligence was doing the training and the army. It was done by a guy named Charlie Wilson, a congressman from, from Texas. But the question was, why would the CIA and Israelis, why would they arm the most anti-Western group out there? Because they were creating the group that became Al-Qaeda and had to be extremely anti-Western. The Mossad connection. Charlie Wilson was a congressman in Washington, but his, his handler was the head of Mossad in Washington, D.C., this man Zvi Rafia. He was the handler of Charlie Wilson since 1973. He managed him. And the, this Israeli agent used Charlie Wilson's congressional office as if it were his own. As you can see from the book here, Charlie Wilson's War, Rafia always acted as if he owned Wilson's office. And they, they together put together this operation. This is bin Laden's first trainer. He's a man named Ali Muhammad. He's a Hebrew-speaking Egyptian, if you believe that. And this man was involved in all of those terror attacks that happened in the 1990s. This man set up, the, set up the cell in Nairobi that bombed the American embassies in Africa. This man trained the guy who killed Rabbi Kahane. And then, after, and, then he, and then he was put in federal penitentiary and he disappeared from federal penitentiary without a trace. 
Then the group Gulbadin that the Israelis had trained became Al Qaeda in 1994. They became Al Qaeda. Now, if you understand the current situation with ISIS, Al Qaeda then became ISIS. So it's the Israelis create this cadre, this group of terrorists who then change names and change places, but they remain the target. So when America strikes ISIS, when America strikes Al Qaeda, they're actually striking Islamic nations. They're striking, they're not hitting the enemy. They're fighting ISIS. They're hitting infrastructure, power plants, water plants, hospitals. <laughs> then this is about 1993, the first bombing in the World Trade Center. The first bombing in the World Trade Center, to my mind, was to put in your mind the idea that Arabs are trying to blow, blow up the World Trade Center. So the interesting thing that this narrative was given to us by an Israeli, Michael Sheratov, who was the prosecutor in this case in 1993, and Judge Michael Mukasey, a fellow Zionist, was the judge who oversaw the whole thing. Now, if you remember, the bomb went off and eight people died or six people died, and the FBI paid this Egyptian colonel here one million dollars to testify. He was the informant. He was the one who kind of like set these people up. The blind shake. The blind shake didn't blow up the World Trade Center. The FBI did. Here we have plan number six. It's the, the Zionist plan for the new Pearl Harbor. This was planned in advance. The, this man, um, Philip Zelikow, had a catastrophic terrorism study group in which they were imagining the transforming event that would change this nation. This was published two years before 9-11. Another one of the authors was Ashton Carter, top left, and the man with the blue sweater. These are Rothschild agents. These men, when they wrote that paper, were working for a group called Global Technology Partners, which is an exclusive affiliate of Rothschild North America. Their whole business is, is getting onto the gravy train of American defense spending. That's where the money is. They take the money from us, they put it into war, and the Rothschilds profit from it. And another group was PNAC, Project for a New American Century. They said that the process of transforming the American military into this worldwide dominant force would, would be a, a, a long change absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor, which is exactly what 9-11 was meant to be. Now, this is another point. The Israeli Mossad controlled security at U.S. airports, the key U.S. airports, on 9-11. And the men that ran this company, ICTS, based in Holland, are these characters here. Mr. Shukerman, Yair Shamir, the son of Shamir, and Boaz Harel. It's a Rothschild company. They controlled passenger screening at Boston Airport, Newark Airport, etc. They controlled who got on the planes. Now, then again, Israelis created false histories for these men. Fifteen of these 19 supposed hijackers lived in Florida, where many of them had been given duplicate licenses, and others had reported having lost their passports. So what you have is a game where you have two people that are using the same identity. One is an Israeli agent that looks like him, and one is the person himself. In this way, they leave a fake trail for that person, incriminating him. This is explained in the very good book, The Little Drummer Girl, by John Le Carre. It's an Israeli plot. It's an Israeli action. This is what they do. They leave fake trails for people. They incriminate them. And in the book, the Mossad person says to this actress, terror is theater. Theater is a con trick. Do you know what that means, con trick? You've been deceived. 9-11, in July 2001, Zionists got the lease for the World Trade Center. Zionist is, again, Israeli nationalist, people who believe in Israel over everything else. It's a political ideology. It's not a religion. It's not a race. It's not an ethnicity. It's a political ideology, flat and simple. Now, how that happened, how did Larry Silverstein get the World Trade Center is very interesting. He got it through Ronald Lauder. Ronald Lauder, the son of Estee Lauder, he was in charge of the privatization scheme for New York State. And in this scheme, they decided to privatize the World Trade Center. Now, Mr. Lauder also funds a school at Mossad University in Israel called the IDC. And at the IDC, the person who runs his school is Major General 
Danny Rothschild. The Rothschilds, the Rothschild family of Britain and France, they built Israel. They paid for Israel. They built the first 30 settlements. The first one is called Rishon Letzion, the first in Zion. That's where Danny Rothschild was born. So they, they made a few children as well to carry on the family genes. Now, what's the connection between Larry Silverstein and the buildings? Well, the Port Authority owned the World Trade Center. The Port Authority was headed by this man, Lou Eisenberg, another Zionist. There were some very convoluted negotiations in the summer of 2001, and the World Trade Center passed to Larry Silverstein. These two men are on the board of the United Jewish Appeal, the largest funding organization for the state of Israel in the United States of America. So it was the Zionist connection that got the building to Larry Silverstein. Larry Silverstein also happens to be a very close friend of Bibi Netanyahu. This is from the Israeli media. For years, Netanyahu and Silverstein have kept in close touch. Every Sunday afternoon, New York time, Netanyahu would call Silverstein. It made no difference where Netanyahu was, he would always call. And their ties continued after Netanyahu became prime minister. What were they talking about every Sunday afternoon for years? Well, finally, Larry Silverstein, on July 24th, he got the Twin Towers in his hand. And then he controlled everything about the building. The first thing he did was eject the, he jacked the, the, rent, the rent up 40% and insured it against terrorism. This is what was left five weeks later of the World Trade Center. All that was left was steel and dust. And on September 11th, the Israeli military chief, Ehud Barak, the one who had trained Osama bin Laden, came on to BBC. He happened to be in London. He happened to be in the studio of the BBC World Television, the largest television network in the English-speaking world. And he said this. He said, it's time to launch an operational, concrete war against terror. He said the world will never be the same from today on. And he blamed Osama bin Laden. What's the connection here? Ehud Barak was the commander of Bibi Netanyahu in a covert commando force called the Sayeret Matkal. This is a covert independent commando force that serves directly under the Israeli chief of staff and military intelligence. On 9-11, this man in, with the New York Police Department hat, his name is Ehud, Ehud Olmert, former Prime Minister of Israel, he was in New York City on September 10th and 11th, but his presence was kept out of the news completely. Why? What was he doing in September 10th and 11th in New York City that had to be kept secret? Here he is with Bibi Netanyahu. Here he is nine days later, ten days later, comes and sits next to Mr. Giuliani. You see, New York City and Jerusalem are sister cities. And this man was the mayor of Jerusalem. And he comes to New York City, and it's not reported. It would usually be front page news. Then the Israeli son of the Mossad, Michael Sheratov, this man here, controlled the 9-11 investigation. He was put in charge. He was the assistant attorney general. He was supposed to prosecute the crimes of 9-11. But they didn't even investigate the crime. There has never been an investigation of 9-11, full stop. John Ashcroft put Michael Sheratov in charge of the investigation. And then what he did, he oversaw the destruction of evidence the destruction and confiscation of the critical evidence. It was a cover-up from the very beginning. Then George Bush made him head of Homeland Security, number two, in which position he remained in charge of the evidence. Then 13, the Zionists, Zionists controlled junkyards, two of them in New Jersey. They managed the destruction of the evidence. The evidence was taken to their junkyard, cut into small pieces, mixed with other scrap, and shipped to Asia. At a time when the price of scrap steel was the lowest it had been in 50 years, this was destruction of evidence. This was not business. This is a pile of steel. All the steel was destroyed. And then the Zionists, a Zionist again is a supporter of Israel, they presided over the 9-11 lawsuits and tort litigation. There were 3,000 victims. That was a lot of litigation. It all went to this man, Judge Alvin K. Hellerstein in Manhattan. Now there's a problem here. His son is a lawyer in Israel 
who works for the key defendant in the 9-11 litigation, that company I told you about, ICTS, the people who were responsible for this passenger screening at the airports. If those 19, if those 19 hijackers got on the plane, they would know how they got on. The conflict of interest was his son was working, as I said, for the parent, for the law firm that over, that controlled that ICTS company. So that's a primary family conflict of interest. You cannot, a judge cannot oversee a case when his son or his wife is working for the defendant. That's completely not right. And then we had, as I said, 3,000 victims. The first 2,900 victims were given money out of the com compensation fund, which was managed by Kenneth Feinberg, another Zionist. He, he gave the money to the people, then they had to sign a line where they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow, they wouldn't ex talk about how much money they got or the terms. There were 100 families left. They held out for a court process, and they were treated with Sheila Birnbaum. One by one, every single family was settled out of court. So all 3,000 families were settled out of court, and there has not been one day in court for a single 9-11 victim. That's not justice. This is Judge McCasey. This is the fellow Zionist judge who oversaw the, 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 the court process in the 1993 bombing, and he then oversaw Larry Silverstein's insurance claim with the insurance companies, where Larry Silverstein got paid twice for the destruction of his buildings. He made from $100 million of a down payment with borrowed money, he got something like $5 billion. The 15 point is Benjamin Netanyahu admits that 9-11 benefits Israel. He said on 9-11 to the New York Times, he was asked, how will this affect Israeli-American relations? And Netanyahu said, it's very good. It will generate immediate sympathy. Who would say it's very good when there are 30,000 people who are thought to be in the rubble dead? A couple years later, he said in Hebrew, speaking to an Israeli audience, he said, we are benefiting. We are benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. Israel is benefiting from that, not America. And then the point that the Zionists control the myth. They wrote the myth. This man, Philip Zelikow, was in charge of the 9-11 Commission. And he wrote, this, he wrote the outline for the report before the people even began working on the report. And this man's specialty, he went to school, he's a Zionist. He went to school and he, he got a master's degree or a PhD in on the creation and maintenance of the public myth. Because what we've been sold is a myth. We've been told a myth that Islam is trying to attack our nation. And unfortunately, Donald Trump still supports that myth. He was in Tampa the other day, and he said radical Islamic terrorists are, are determined to attack this nation, as they did on 9-11. That's false. And for Donald Trump to say that that's the case is a very, very dangerous thing. And here's the people who worked on the report. They said, this is the John Farmer, he counsel for the report. He said, what the government told us about what, the, what Congress, what they told Congress, the commission, the media, and the public about who knew what when was almost entirely and inexplicably untrue. And these are the commissioners themselves, Thomas Keene and Lee Hamilton. Thomas Keene said, to this day, we don't know why NORAD told us what they told us. It was just so far from the truth. So the American people have been given a pack of lies about what happened on 9-11. And it's time we wake up from this nightmare. And my last point is that then, is, in, if you go to New, Ground Zero, if you go to New York City, there's a big memorial there, and there's a strange building called the Oculus, and there's a shopping mall. And they, and they have these water, these ponds, and there's names are carved in granite around the ponds. This was designed and given to us by the Israelis. The Israeli engineer, the Israeli designer who built it is this man here. The World Trade Center Memorial was designed by a friend of the Netanyahu family. His name is Michael Arad. He's the son of Moshe Arad, the former Israeli ambassador to the United States. This is how they want to control the story. They give you the idea for the story, they control the story, they make it happen, and then they control the legacy. 
So they, young American kids go to this ground zero and they go through a museum that's run by Israelis, built and, and run by Israelis, to teach them the lie that Islam did this to America. Here's Mayor Bloomberg talking to Netanyahu. They're discussing the four Israelis who died in 9-11. This is 10 years after the fact. Now, the critical thing is that the media has been lying to us. This is the, Washington, this is the New York Times, a Zionist-owned newspaper, family of the B'nai B'rith. Three years after 9-11, they came out with this editorial of the, of the paper, and they said, in the three years since 9-11, we've begun to understand that it's possible to know what happened without knowing what happened. How Orwellian is that? And for 15 years, the controlled media has pushed the false story about 9-11 and the war on terror, all the while suppressing all evidence that disproves the official myth. Why does the media do this? Because we have today, almost all of the media in this country is owned by six companies. And those six companies are owned by the Rothschilds. Here we have media moguls like Rupert Murdoch, who pushed the lies about 9-11, and the war on terror, they are complicit in a criminal cover-up with the people who did 9-11. Now, the Rothschild banksters create people like Mr. Murdoch so they control all the public opinion in this country. That's what the media in the country today, in, the, in NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox News, it's psychological warfare against the American people 24-7. And this is my final slide. This is summing up the, uh, my analysis. And this is from Dr. Alan Sabrosky, uh, who, who wrote this paper called Treason, Betrayal, and Deceit, 9-11 Beyond. And he said, the evidential trail for 9-11 and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq runs from PNAC, APAC, the Israeli lobby and their cohorts, through the mostly Jewish neocons in the Bush administration and back to the Israeli government. None of the denials and political machinations can alter that essential reality. And that's what I'm saying, is that we've been fooled, we've been tricked, we've been deceived into a war, and this is not our interest at all. This is an Israeli war agenda that we have been tricked into fighting. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum. Very powerful, very powerful. Let's hear it for him one more time.